And the third pre, uh, the third keynote speak, uh, third keynote speaker is here now, and Professor Matt. Um... Hi. Do you want me to start my uh, my talk now? Uh, yes. And uh, there is some problem with Professor Alex TPT. Uh, so I see. Okay. So okay. All right. The okay, Professor Alex, maybe oh. you can yeah. go to the. Uh, inquiry uh, room to solve the problem. And yeah, uh, thing, thanks a lot, Matt. No problem. So, <laughs> thanks, yeah. Professor Matt. So, uh, I will introduce Professor Matt first, and then uh, Professor can start sh uh, sharing the screen. Okay, so uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Matt Grasball Christensen from Aalborg University, Denmark. And Professor uh, Matt received the MSc and PhD degrees in 2002 and 2005, respectively, from Aalborg University in Denmark, where he is also currently employed at the Department of Architecture Design, Media Technology as full professor in audio processing and is head and founder of the Audio Analysis Lab. He is a member of the IEEE Audio and Acoustic Signal Processing Technical Committee, and a founding member of the Eurasip Special Area Team in Acoustic Speech and Music Signal Processing. He is senior member of the IEEE, member of Eurasip, and a member of the Danish Academy of Technical Sciences. So his speech title is Signal Adaptive and Perceptually Optimized Sound Zones. Uh, Professor Matt Grasball Christensen, welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to uh, tell you a bit about uh, our work on, uh, on sound zones. Uh, so let me just uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, the problem here. Uh, what we want in, with sound zones is that we want to deliver different uh, contents in different zones in an acoustic environment using a set of loudspeakers. Uh, and you see this uh, reproduced here in the, uh, in the figure at the bottom here. And uh, I will use two zones to exemplify uh, uh, the, the involved technical problems here. And those two zones are referred to as a bright zone and a dark zone. So imagine that you want to deliver uh, two different uh, audio contents in two different parts of the room here. Then the bright zone is the zone wherein you would like to uh, uh, reproduce a desired signal. And then the dark zone is, is, uh, is another zone where uh, you would like to hear something else. And in this dark zone, you would like to attenuate uh, the desired contents from the bright zone. So to do this, what you do is that you have, uh, you have to define these uh, zones. And the way you do this is that you measure impulse responses or model impulse responses from all loudspeakers to points inside these zones here. And this is what is denoted here at, as HML here. And then uh, you have the desired signal is, uh, is what we call a virtual source here, which is uh, also shown here in the figure. And, uh, and what should be reproduced of this uh, virtual source in the different zones is specified by this HM set here. Then what you do is that you design an FRR filter. Uh, these are the one called Q here on the right for each combination of contents and, uh, and loudspeaker. Um, Yes, and then there's basically two objectives. One is that you would like to reproduce the desired sound fields as well as possible. Uh, that goes without saying, but at the same time, you would also minimize, uh, like to minimize the leakage between the zone. So you don't want the bright zone contents to be heard in the dark zone. Here's an example here. Uh, let's imagine two people uh, watching a movie uh, in, 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 in the living room and they have a couple of loudspeakers there and uh, they would like to listen to the uh, movie, which is here, Zootopia, in two different languages, English and Danish, and then it might sound something like this. And of course, this is a big mess and it's hard to distinguish the two, but the idea in sound zones is that you use multiple loudspeakers, like in a sound bar or in a circular uh, array or something like that, 
to produce uh, different uh, contents in the two different zones here with the chairs with the people sitting. And this could be like having an English speak, uh, speech zone and a Danish uh, speech zone as in, in, in this movie here. Um, the contrasts between uh, the desired uh, contents and the amount of, of leakage to the zone, that's what you call the contrast. In, in uh, the state of the art, you typically uh, achieve around 15 dB uh, attenuation in the dark zone. And uh, this is uh, not enough, it's believed. Um, it's certainly not what you would consider a high fi quality. Uh, and interference is uh, clearly audible if you listen uh, to it, even with, uh, with this kind of uh, contrast here. So the idea we had in, in our work here uh, was based on uh, one of the big success stories of uh, modern signal processing, namely MP3. And in MP3, you had what's known as the 13 dB miracle at, uh, at Bell Labs in, in the early 1990s. And what they did there was that, uh, that they showed uh, that with a 13 dB uh, signal to noise ratio, if you do appropriate uh, shaping of the noise that you insert uh, via quantization and coding, of course, uh, then you can achieve much better results here. And, and our idea here was that there may be something similar applies here in, in sound zones because previous work has not taken into account uh, uh, the human auditory system. And in fact, most of it isn't even adaptive. It doesn't take even the signal statistics uh, into account. But if we imagine hearing uh, such audio with, with a contrast of 15 dB, just uh, white noise added at 15 dB, then it sounds like this. Well, are you saying that because he's a sloth, he can't be fast? I thought in Zootopia, anyone could be anything. We would not consider this good quality, right? This is very noisy. But if you shape this uh, noise with a, with a psychoacoustic uh, model, then it sounds like this. Well, are you saying that because he's a sloth, he can't be fast? I thought in Zootopia, anyone could be anything. So this is still not perfect, but I think we can all agree that this is actually a huge improvement here, even though the amount of noise you introduce is, uh, is, uh, is the same. It's just that the error uh, or the noise in this case is, is shaped here. And then the question is, of course, how do you translate this uh, into uh, the problem of uh, sound zones? So uh, the idea here for us is uh, thus to shape interference or error, what you want to call it, in a given zone adaptively using a perceptual masking model so that it's the least audible. And then the second step is that we integrate this into what we call the variable span optimal filters. Uh, to obtain perceptually optimal filtering capable of controlling the trade-off between reproduction error on one hand and the contrast on the other hand. And as we'll see in a second, these two are, are mutually uh, 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 conflicting uh, criteria. Here. And I should say that this is uh, brand new work here. Uh, the first two journal papers on these topics here have just been published in these two uh, IEEE transactions uh, uh, papers. And uh, the mathematical foundation of this work here actually lies in our work on these variable span linear filters, which we did in signal enhancement. And uh, I just uh, mentioned our, our book here very briefly. Uh, it's a very flexible and elegant framework uh, that unifies uh, optimal filtering and subspace methods. And you can apply them to a lot of different problems and you can apply them to sound zones as you'll see in a second. So what we realized is that mathematically, uh, the problem of uh, signal enhancement and uh, sound zone generations are mathematically similar. In speech enhancement, you have uh, that you want to design uh, enhancement filters that uh, uh, have as low signal distortion uh, as possible while, while it has a high noise reduction. Uh, conversely, in sound zones, you want to reproduce uh, uh, the signal, the desired signal in, in these zones as well as possible, while on the other hand, minimizing the leakage. Uh, uh, to the other sounds. So a few definitions here, returning to our figure from before. So we say we have L loudspeakers and we have a number of, of control points defined in these uh, zones where we have measured impulse responses from loudspeaker L to point M. And uh, then the reproduced sound pressure PM in one of these points is the convolution of the input signal X with this impulse response, of course, but then also with the uh, control filter Q. And we can introduce some useful definitions here. We can absorb this H into X, which gives us Y. And then we can write, uh, write the filtering here as, a, as, a, as an inner product like this. And um, we can define these quantities you'll see here on the right. 
where uh, y is then the filtering of the input signal with h. And then we can stack all the y's for a particular, from, from all loudspeakers to a particular point m in, in one uh, vector uh, like this here. And down here in D of M, we have the desired sound pressure. So P is the one that we, that we are reproducing given a set of filters and D of M is the one we would like to have. And this is specified, as I said, with this virtual source X convolved with uh, 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 some uh, desired uh, impulse res response there that defines uh, where the source is uh, coming uh, from. Right. So the error between the desired and reproduced sound pressures we can exp uh, express as this epsilon here. And it's the difference between DM and PM in time here. And we can of course write this using the definitions before as this inner product between the Y's and the control filters. And then we subtract that from the desired one. But the key point here in integrating uh, uh, a perceptual model here is that this here is, is not just a two norm on the error here, it's a weighted reproduction error. And it's weighted by a weighting filter W of M. And such that we have a convolution here of this uh, W here with the uh, error there. And then we get these D tilde, which is the perceptually weighted uh, desired signal and P tilde, which is the uh, desired reproduced signal there. And from these definitions here, we can define reproduction errors uh, where we have a signal distortion power. So how much distortion that's present in the byte zone, which can be written as this, uh, uh, the sum over all the, uh, the samples n, and then uh, all the control points or microphones in, in, in a zone, in this case, the bright zone. So it's the difference between the desired and, and the reconstructed and then perceptually weighted. And you can express this in this way that you see here in terms of these, uh, the Q vector, the R vector and the R uh, matrix too. And then in the dark zone where we would like to minimize the power, that means that the desired uh, sound pressure is actually uh, zero. So in that case, this uh, simplifies with the expression you see here at the bottom here, where we have uh, something that's purely determined in terms of uh, uh, Q uh, transpose times RD times Q down here. So if we have these two terms here, one, the distortion in the bright zone and the residual error power, uh, which is essentially the, uh, the leakage here. And we have a trade-off between these two uh, because if we would like to have a uh, very good attenuation here, uh, of this, uh, this uh, the, uh, the uh, residual error power here, it means we must introduce uh, signal distortion in the bright zone. Yes, and uh, you can see how here on the right here, how these covariance, uh, covariance matrix here are defined here in this uh, 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 covariance uh, vector here also. So we can combine these two uh, objective functions and, and control the trade-off with a parameter of mu such that we have a objective function comprised of this S tilde B and this S tilde D, which are functions of the unknown control flows we like to find. And then we have U to control the trade-off here. And uh, this gives us the combined um, objective function that you see here. And, what, uh, and then interpretation of this is of course that mu is a Lagrange multiplier. And then you can think of this as minimizing S tilde B with a constraint on S tilde D, and you can also do it the other way around if, if you want, and you can solve in principle for this uh, mu, uh, even though this is not commonly done in the literature. So in, in, in applying the, the variable span filters here, we perform joint diagonalization of these uh, R tilde B and R tilde D, uh, such that we find uh, U, uh, which are generalized eigenvectors, such that when multiplied onto R, B, they produce a diagonal matrix with the uh, non-negative values on a diagonal, which are the corresponding uh, eigenvalues. And then it uh, produces a, uh, an identity matrix when multiplied onto RD there. Um, so RB has to be uh, positive semi-definite, uh, while RD has to uh, uh, be uh, positive definite uh, for this to exist. And then also uh, you, can, you can define these eigenvectors and eigenvalues as the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of uh, R tilde D inverse times uh, R tilde uh, B, as you see up here. Then what we do in these uh, variable span filters is that we express the control filter of Q in terms of these eigenvectors, such that Q is equal to U times L at uh, U subscript LJ times A, and then A is a coefficient vector. 
that then determines uh, uh, the linear combinations of the eigenvectors that we use in forming this filter. And uh, when you do that, you can see here that uh, you get uh, simple expressions for, uh, for the two distortions, the bright zone uh, reproduction error that you see here at the top S uh, tilde B and, uh, and the residual power in the dark zone S tilde D here is, is purely specified in terms of this A as you can see here. And then if we say we don't wanna use all the eigenvectors, we only take uh, some of them, uh, let's say V, then what we have is essentially a low rank uh, approximation or a low rank uh, filter. And then we optimize over this AB instead of Q. And then the combined objective function is given by the expression we see here, where we see it's quite neatly uh, expressed in terms of the, these eigenvectors here. You see it's, it's quite an uh, elegant way of expressing these uh, uh, distortion terms. And then if you solve for the coefficient vector uh, AB here, um, which is, can be thought of as a function of, of, of mu, you get this expression here, which finally leads to expression of the variable span uh, filter for the sound zones that you see down here, where you take uh, the eigenvectors times this uh, correlation uh, vector here, and then you have the uh, generalized eigenvector UV again, and then you scale this by mu, which was the parameter that controlled the trade-off between the two terms in our objective function and the uh, eigenvalues you see here. And then there's a second parameter, which is V. And then when you select a pair of V and, uh, and, uh, and mu, then you get different solutions. And a very interesting thing here is that you actually get, uh, when, 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 when we first uh, started looking at it from this perspective here, we realized that you can actually find a lot of the methods that you can see in the literature uh, that were proposed beforehand. You can get those as special cases here. For example, if you choose V equal to one, you can get the acoustic contrast method. Or if you choose V equal to the, uh, uh, the dimensions of the matrix, you get the, the methods that are known as uh, person matching. And it means you have a continuum solutions uh, here for solving the sound zones, uh, sound zone generation problem here. And this is also exemplified here. So first, uh, let me start by explaining uh, the figure on the right here. What you see here is, is the bright zone uh, distortion um, as a function of the number of eigenvectors ranging from one to all. This is a monotonically decreasing function as a function of the eigenvectors here. Uh, so the higher V is, uh, the, the smaller the distortion error is gonna be in, in the bright zone. Uh, but, but on the other hand, if you want a high contrast, the highest contrast is achieved by choosing the lowest possible eigenvector. So for example, the acoustic contrast method is obtained by simply selecting V equal to one here. So you can get all the solutions you want on this red curve here by selecting V. Uh, on the left, you can sort of see a solution space that you get here with the variable span spanning uh, filters here. And what you have on the x-axis is the number of eigenvectors ranging from one to all and the mu from zero and uh, up. And what you can see there is that you can uh, get different solutions. Uh, so for example, with a mu of zero, you, you get what you may call the minimum distortion solutions. And if you then choose all the uh, V eigenvectors, you, you get the solution that's known in, uh, for example, beamforming as uh, the MVDR solution. Uh, on the other hand, if you take all eigenvectors and you choose a mu of equal to one, you get the pressure matching uh, method, as I already mentioned. And if you relate that to a speech enhancement, then this is what you would call the Wiener filter. And then we can move down the line here uh, for mu equal to one and use less eigenvectors. And then you get what you may essentially think of as a variable span uh, Wiener solution here. And then with uh, V equal to one, you essentially get the acoustic contrast control method where you get the highest possible contrast between the energy in the, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, 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 bright zone and the energy in the uh, dark zone, the leaked uh, here. I should also mention here that, of course, now we have a method here uh, that, that uh, is, is very flexible and can do a lot of things. And we have this combined with the perceptual weighting uh, here, but both the perceptual weighting and these optimal filters, you can use these both adaptively and non-adaptively. So for example, you can just assume some signal statistics, for example, that the signals are white, uh, and this will give you a fixed filter. 
You can also uh, use uh, uh, average statistics, for example, for speech or music, whatever contents, and then that will give you one filter that you can apply to your contest, uh, contents. But the best solution, of course, is adaptive, meaning that you would compute the short-term statistics of the, uh, the methods there. And this is really something that's been overlooked in the literature on, on sound zones. Um, yeah, a difficulty there is, of course, that when you uh, solve these problems here, actually the problems are of quite uh, high uh, dimensionality. So the perceptual weighting uh, we, we, we have been using has been based on the, uh, the psychoacoustic model of Van der Paar, which is derived from Torsten Dow's uh, models of the human auditory uh, system there. And we use it to calculate the masking curve adaptively. And what you get this way is that you allow for bigger reproduction errors where the mask has a high power in the spectrum and penalized areas where the mask has less than no power. And the weighting filter is computed as the risk particle of the masking curve to, to get this. And the total area is then the integral of the perceptually shaped reproduction errors. And this is important to understand that this means that that you can trade errors off in one part of the spectrum for errors in another part of the spectrum because of this integral. And sometimes this is uh, also misunderstood in audio coding that, that you have to sort of uh, put the conversation error below the masking curve. This is not the case. You can, you can trade errors off in different parts of the spectrum. And if you have a signal like you see here at the bottom here that has some harmonic contents, a lot of energy, low frequencies, it means you have a lot of masking going on. So you can, make, you can mask uh, uh, a lot of uh, signal there, but at higher frequencies, uh, you see there's much less energy and uh, the masking cap capabilities are, uh, are much less and you will be able to mask much, uh, much less than the lower frequencies for this particular uh, signal here. And then of course, you can, you can ask yourself, wait a second, what is the masker and the maskee in, in, in the two cases? And if we pretend we have two zones, alpha and beta, uh, then alpha uh, is the one we want to play back in, uh, in the alpha zone, then the, the, re the reconstructed signal there is the masker, right? And, and the beta content is gonna be the masky. And in the, and in the other zone, zone beta, it's gonna be the other way around. That beta is the contents that will mask the leakage from the other zones with the alpha contents, right? So in the two zones, the, the, uh, the masking will be computed diff from different uh, signals. So here's a brief overview of what uh, the system uh, looks like. And you can implement this in different ways, but we've done it here in, in, in the frequency domain. Um, and it's just to give you an idea what, what, this, uh, what this looks like here. So uh, the filtering is performed in uh, what you may call an uh, STFT uh, 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 or a filter bank, a STFT based filter bank, where the control filters are applied in the frequency, dom uh, frequency domain after which you have inverse filtering and windowing and you play back and then you get reconstructed signals in the bright zone and the dark zone. Um, and the computation of the control filters is what you see here at the bottom here that where you have HM set defining uh, via the convolution, the desired signal in the different zones, uh, there are different points in the different zones here. Uh, apply windowing, going to frequency domain, applying the perceptual weighting from the masking model going back to time domain. Uh, and down here at the bottom, you see how the, uh, how the uh, model of the actual, or it could be the actual impulse response, but it could also be a model, a hat, uh, H hat ML, of the impulse responses from different microphones, uh, loudspeakers, pairs. Again, exactly the same, windowing, Fourier transform, multiplication, and then back again. And this you can perform, uh, you can compute the covariance or correlation matrices and perform the joint diagonalization. And then given V and mu, you can form the filters, uh, control filters Q. Yeah, so uh, we have conducted a listening test that I would like to uh, present for you. And uh, this was uh, done with the setup we see here with two zones, uh, zone alpha, uh, the orange one, and zone beta, the blue one here. And so this is mimicking the, uh, the TV application we saw earlier. Uh, with a sound bar and with a wall behind it here. Um, and uh, so we have the loudspeakers you see here indicated by the triangles. And uh, uh, yes, and then we apply the, the, uh, the uh, sound zone uh, control filters to obtain the, uh, uh, the desired uh, signals in the two uh, uh, zone here or the reproduced signals in the two zones there. And then 
what we do in our listening test is that we play back these signals here. And so it was 16 uh, loudspeakers, uh, 37 control points inside the zone, 16 kilohertz sampling frequency. Um, yes, and these are actually, this is actually based on actual room impulse responses that are measured, uh, uh, in this case, actually by, uh, by, by uh, Fraunhofer. And so uh, we presented this to uh, listeners and uh, tested uh, the overall quality uh, with the MUSTRA test methodology, ITU standard for a test, where you get a ranking from zero to 100 and there's anchor points and there's hidden references uh, in there. And on the right, you see the result here with the mean scores and the confidence intervals of the methods here. And you can see there's an anchor here at uh, anchor at here around 80 and the references, uh, the hidden reference is, uh, is scored 100. So that confirms we have good listeners here. But then you can see that the pressure matching and acoustic contrast control methods here, they don't do so well here. Uh, and if you do nothing, that's no control. So you don't try to do anything to the contents. You get the, uh, you only get 32.7 here. So it really shows what you, what you can do that, and that they have to do something uh, with, uh, with, with, with sound zones here if you want to achieve this, uh, this objective here. And what you then see with the, the two methods here, PVAST and APVAST, is a perceptually shaped linear uh, variable span linear filters, and then the adaptive perceptively weighted uh, variable span linear filters here. And you can see here they both perform statistically significantly better than the state of the art methods, PMM and ACC. Uh, but you can also see there's not so huge a difference between the APVAST and PVAST there. And I, we, we believe that there are some uh, things that can still be improved there because, of course, the adaptive one should uh, be better than the, than the, uh, than the non-adaptive one here. But um, anyway, so for us, this, the main point here was to really show that if you introduce this perceptual weighting here, then you can really do uh, things much better than you could before. And I think this, this point is clearly made with, with, with the results we have obtained here. Um, I can play you a couple of examples here, in a, one of them with piano and orchestra. If, uh, if we have no control, so don't apply any uh, sound soul, sound filter at all, we get this. So you can barely hear the piano when the orchestra is playing, right? And then if you take the pressure matching method, you get this. And here you can, you can hear that actually the piano is reconstructed really well, as well as it's possible, right? But there's very poor attenuation of the orchestra. So that's the poorest performance you can get in terms of acoustic contrast. Then if we listen to the PVAST method, this is what you get. And you can hear that you're getting a better contrast and you're getting a, a really good re reconstruction at the same time. Then if we listen in the other zone, then the orchestra sounds like this. And if you listen to the acoustic contrast control method. So you can hear that there's a really good contrast, really good attenuation of the piano. But at the same time, you actually, you can hear that the reconstruction of the uh, of the of the orchestra is also suffering from a lot of distortion, right? So that's the inherent trade-off you have when you're doing this here. And then with our method, and this is the adaptive one, this is what you get. So you can hear this is much, much better. And you can also hear that when there's silence, uh, of course you can hear something. And also in terms of what we're discussing with perceptual model, what, what happens when you have silence is that you have no master, right? So all you have is that you can shape by the uh, absolute threshold of, of, of hearing in that case. So the audio examples here are available at this uh, URL down here if you want to listen more uh, to all this. There's a lot of applications, of course, of this kind of technology here. Uh, for example, in, um, in cars, you can imagine that uh, you can, uh, and the cars are nice because, well, it's difficult in the sense that it's a small room and so forth. But it's nice that it's a controlled environment where the manufacturers can do a lot of uh, things with where they put uh, loudspeakers and what kind of materials they use and so forth. And uh, we can imagine a case where we'd like to be able to hear different things in different parts of a car. And there are cars there out now, now that do really uh, something like this, but it's very, very simple and it doesn't function uh, that well in, in, in my opinion here. Uh, another example is the uh, home theater that we uh, just, uh, 
uh, saw earlier. Another is uh, museums uh, where you'd like to hear different things in different uh, exhibits. It could be in hospitals where different patients would like to hear different things without disturbing each other and so forth. Uh, but it could also be for outdoor sound, uh, stages, like for uh, open air uh, concerts and festivals, because in those cases, sound pollution is a huge problem, right? That, uh, of course, you have that music leads from one stage to the other stages. That's one problem. But even worse, the uh, neighbors, uh, typically these are just outside or even inside uh, large cities. And then the uh, amount of uh, energy that uh, uh, leaks elsewhere, it can be really considerable. And it's a huge nuisance for the, uh, for the people who live there. So these are, these are some examples of, uh, of uh, what you can use this uh, technology for. So some conclusions here. So we've cast the sound zone generation problem as an optimal filtering problem. And we've included perceptual shaping of uh, interference. And in this linear uh, variable spatial linear filters, we have explicit control over the trade-off between reprox and error and acoustic contrast. And unlike speech enhancement, where you don't have the involved signal statistics, you have the signal statistics here. So you can actually compute the trade-offs. You can pre-compute it and you can find out how well you can solve the problem. And a nice thing about this optimal filtering framework is that it contains the existing methods, uh, for example, ACC, PMM, and some of the combinations of as special cases. And what we've seen here is that the proposed method outperforms existing methods uh, We've, and we will confirm this in master listening test here. So uh, to conclude my talk, I would like to mention some ongoing work and some future work also. Uh, as you've seen, we have developed these, uh, well, uh, excuse me, we have also developed frequency domain uh, versions of these filters here. And these uh, are, are much simpler because they are much lower dimensionality. And so they're much faster to compute there, uh, but they are approximations. Uh, to the work that I presented here. So they are approximations to the time domain versions. But these actually also optimize the broadband uh, perceptually weighted errors and, and contrast. And this work has just been accepted uh, in the IGB transactions on audio speech and language processing. We also developed uh, fast implementations uh, based on conjugate gradient methods and Krulov subspaces. And this is currently in review. So that's another interesting thing we think that, that takes us a step toward becoming uh, really uh, practical because now we can see we can do really well with these methods here. Uh, so the next step is, of course, making these things more practical such that they will also be deployed in, in the real world. And one key thing we have realized, and this is when you were listening to the uh, signals from before, where you heard that sometimes you have silence and, and that you saw that the masking capabilities in the different zones may, may vary then actually, instead of just treating this uh, mu as a user parameter that controls this trade-off, we think it's actually really important to treat it as a constraint optimization problem because then you can impose physically meaningful constraints uh, on, on the solution and you know what kind of solution you get. And we think this is the key to obtaining consistently good results uh, across different uh, types of material. So, that, so that's one thing we have learned uh, recently. Um, Another thing is that if you read the literature, you'll see that uh, sound zone, the current methods, they are not very robust and they do not perform so well in practice. So uh, one study showed, for example, that uh, by changing the temperature in the room, you can go from this working quite well to not at all. And uh, the takeaway from that for me is that we need to look at next uh, how to make the methods more robust to errors in the room impulse responses. Uh, I, I think this is the key to making uh, these things work in the real world. Because of course, uh, if we don't have an error microphone like you would have in active noise control, uh, then, then uh, you cannot count on the uh, room impulse responses uh, being very accurate. They will change when people move around. Uh, they will change with changing uh, temperature and, and uh, humidity and, and all those kinds of things there. So we really must make uh, these uh, methods robust to make this uh, work. Yes, thanks for the attention. This concludes my talk. And I want to thank uh, Jesper Ken Nielsen and Tae Wong Lee, who, uh, uh, who contributed to this work and worked with me on this topic here. So here's a link to our homepage and also our YouTube channel, where we have a ton of videos about our research in the audio analysis lab. So if you're interested in learning more about these things and the other things we're doing, please uh, visit our uh, webpage there. Thank you very much.
Yeah, many thanks for the innovative talk given by Professor Matt Grasswalk Christensen. Okay, so uh, it's QA time. Uh, if you have any question, uh, you can click chat and enter one or directly type in uh, the chat box. Um, so I guess, uh, so if there's no uh, questions from the audience, uh, I would just ask a question uh, for Professor Matt. Um, this work is really very interesting. Uh, so uh, you mentioned about the temperature uh, that will like influence the, the, the robustness of the method. So what are the other uh, also like influence the I mean you can you can first uh, theoretically and then of course factors determine uh, latitude and temperature and those but I think even worse than uh, the impulse responses are the rooms uh, influenced uh, what you can and cannot do a lot and then of course You know, it make a huge difference if there's contributing factors that make this uh, a challenge you, you to realize the potential here. Mm. Yeah, yeah, right. Thanks very much. So there's a question uh, from Professor Alex, so uh, uh, he actually asked, how does your approach relate to PCA and more broadly to representation mm. learning? So uh, PCA, I, I, I imagine the reason for this question is the use of the generalized eigenvalue decomposition. You do not have to look at this as, uh, as any kind of uh, soft-based method as, as, as such. It, you can just think of it as, as optimal filtering. Uh, and and what, we're, what we're using the generalized eigenvalue decomposition for is just Expressing the control filters in in a uh, in a uh, simple, convenient way that gives us control over these trade-offs that are in, in the problem. That's really what it is. We're, it, it's just it's just a convenient way of looking at it, and it's it and it's one. It, another thing you can do, for example, is that you can bound the performance of the different solutions. You can see that if you make this choice of parameters v and mu, it's going to be less than or larger than this other choice of v and mu. So that's really the power of it. I don't. I don't think of it as 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 learning anything as such about the, the involved signals or anything like that. Um, one thing I do find uh, intriguing is the thought that that with, with this ability to bound things because you're using the eigen vectors and the eigenvalues there, then maybe actually it's possible to uh, relate uh, the performance, the, the best possible performance you can achieve with these methods in different, assuming different acoustic scenarios, because then you would be able to relate them, um, maybe uh, using uh, these uh, eigenvalue uh, decompositions. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks, 